Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. Released by Bioware in the summer of 2003, this classic game has captured the hearts and minds of thousands of fans. Knights of the Old Republic, or KOTOR for short, is also known within smaller circles to have an outstanding speedrun. In this video, I will be sitting down and walking us through the many intricacies and features of this beautiful speedrun. The particular run that we will be viewing today is the world record at time of recording, in the any percent unrestricted category of KOTOR 1. The run was completed by Range on October 21st, 2021, and is considered to be among the most masterful demonstrations of KOTOR gameplay. KOTOR speedruns are filled with complicated glitches and tricks which warrant a very detailed explanation. Many of these glitches were found by myself, and so I am very excited to share this with you today. But first off, some introductions. My name is Lane DeBello. I am a glitch hunter in the KOTOR speedrunning community. I've been around for several years now, and I've found a variety of different glitches. I've also been heavily involved with the routing of the different categories for KOTOR, and these days I also do moderation work for both the Discord and our speedrun.com page. I absolutely love this community and the people in it, and I'm very happy to be working on this project today. KOTOR speedrunning is almost as old as KOTOR itself, with the earliest runs coming only a year or two after the game's initial release. It wasn't until 2015 or 2016 that the speed game's popularity really picked up, with faces like Glasnock and Indy Kenobi dominating the scene. After a brief lull, the game had its most recent resurgence in early 2019, with runners such as Sheet Metal, Warwolf, Me, 30 Cents, Sober, as well as many of the older runners all coming to the scene. The community member responsible for this run is Range, who is a newer member to our community, but also a very talented runner and even quicker study. He quickly rose through the ranks, even surpassing the likes of Chaos Drifter to achieve this outstanding world record. Range got his start out running Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask a few years ago. It wasn't until late in March of 2020 that he joined the KOTOR community, doing some of the more beginner-friendly categories such as NMG. Later on, he moved on to many of the other categories in KOTOR, such as All Quests, Glitchless, as well as the KOTOR 2 categories such as It's Any Percent and It's All Quest and Glitchless and so on. Range has proven to be a very talented speedrunner, as well as a percussionist, which has many transferable skills to code their speedrunning, particularly for menus and tight execution. But more than anything, Range is a true friend and valued member and moderator of our community. Now with introductions out of the way, it's time to talk about this category, Any Percent Unrestricted. The goal of Any Percent is to complete the game by any means possible. Completing the game is defined as getting the final cutscene with Malak after he's been defeated. Unrestricted means that there are no restrictions on glitches and exploits that can be used to complete this, except for some of the global exploits we have our entire game. More details on these rules can be viewed at speedrun.com slash KOTOR1. One other thing of note, this game is timed with a load remover that was first developed by Glasnock. This uh, pauses the timer every single time a load or save is occurring. In this run, Range also makes use of the Auto Splitter, developed by Zero HD, which automatically splits when certain modules are loaded in. This run was the culmination of about a month-long grind from Range. This is the ninth consecutive any percent speedrun that he uploaded to the site. During this time, he was competing with another high-level runner, Chaos Drifter, who is also known for his extreme talent in this game. They had been passing the record back and forth for the start of this month, until about the third week where Range began to just absolutely dominate the category, getting record after record, and Chaos could not keep up. Even to this day, if looking at the obsolete leaderboard, Range has a grand total of 5 runs all faster than Chaos's PB. This period also resulted in a lot more attention being put on the routes, as well as the glitches being used in this route. One such glitch that came about during this time period was the new ship parts skip for Lahan, which we will be discussing later in this run, as well as a variety of other little optimizations that were put in place by me, Luffix, Hotshot, Indy, and Chaos himself, as well as Range, of course. And all of these combined efforts culminated in the amazing world record that you will be looking at today. And with that all out of the way, we're ready to begin the run. Let's go. Alright, so in this run, we select the Masculine Scoundrel at character creation, and there's a variety of different reasons for this. The big reason behind our gender preference is visual cues. 
Range here has developed several setups for glitches that rely on the shape of the masculine player's legs and torsos. If one so chose, they could also run with the feminine player character, however they would have to develop their own visual cues. We also select the Scoundrel class so that we can obtain the Sneak Attack feat. This will be our main source of damage early in the run. For this run, our attribute layout is 18 Strength, 14 Dexterity, 14 Constitution, and 10 Charisma. The high strength is to maximize the melee damage that we will be doing in the first half of the run. The 14 Dexterity is to increase our chance to dodge and reduce our reflex saving throws. The 14 Constitution is to bolster our health and increase our fortitude saving throws versus the governor. Finally, the 10 charisma is to pass one charisma check against the Zerka guards on Kashin. For skills, we take four security to sequence break on the end of Spire, and four awareness so we can see mines, though this isn't a very hard requirement. For our starter feat, we take weapon focused melee weapons. This increases our chance to hit by 5% in the early run. Alright, and with all of this in place, he picks out a cool name, and the timer starts the moment he presses play. Because of the load remover, the timer should pause approximately 750 milliseconds after the run begins, to allow for the load in. As soon as the run starts, we are already confronted with our first glitch, hard buffers. Now, hard buffers aren't called that because they're necessarily difficult, but because they're a variant of a larger glitch called buffers that utilize a hard load. This will make a lot more sense in just a moment. So, hard buffers are used to skip past cutscenes and conversations. The way this is accomplished is by repeatedly pressing the quick save button, this is called the save buffer, to delay the start of a cutscene and get into what's called the dialogue queue without it actually playing. With a cutscene in the dialogue queue, one can load the game for it to be cleared and effectively skipped. In hard buffers, this is accomplished by clicking in the upper right hand corner and hard loading the last quick save made during our save buffer. So, for this particular skip, we'll be hard buffering the opening cutscene. Range is very talented at this, and manages to get the cutscene onto the dialogue queue after only one quick save. He then immediately loads the hard save, navigating the menu at lightning speed, totally skipping the opening cutscene of the game. And with this cutscene skipped, he immediately books it towards the exit from his room. He runs past our tutorial character, Trask, and begins the save buffer while he runs. He's able to move while quick saving by holding down both mouse buttons simultaneously, which causes the main character to auto run. He activates security on the exit, something he would not have been able to do had we not taken that skill at character creation, and then allows the cued Trask conversation to play. This bypasses the Sif ambush cutscene and effectively sequence breaks the Indar Spire. In a traditional sense, we would be considered a softlock right here, as usually there's no way to progress, but luckily for us, we have glitches. So before we can move on, we need to talk about Displaced Loading Zones, or DLZs for short. A Displaced Loading Zone is actually a misnomer from a time before we really understood what was happening, as nothing is really being displaced here, but I digress. A DLZ occurs whenever the controlled player character is in the negative Y direction from a trigger, and precisely lines up with the X coordinate of one of the trigger area's corners. Lining up like this will activate the trigger, despite us being far beyond its usual bounds. A consistent way of triggering these DLZs was discovered by Luffix in late 2020. Now lining up for this trick is very precise, as the X coordinate is a 32-bit precision floating point number. This precision is compounded by the fact that player movement is discrete and not continuous. Put differently, the player character's position is only updated in memory every frame, so most of the time this very thin line that you must be standing on is skipped over when we're running. We remedy this in several ways. First, we all have V-Sync disabled, which causes our frame rate to increase well beyond the range this game was intended to be played at. We also reduce our player's movement speed by pressing the walk button and grinding against walls. That way, the decimal point jumps at a much smaller amount by each frame. Finally, we use visual cues, usually centered around the player's legs, to try and find the exact position to stand in. Once we're in this position, the game will act as if we're standing within that trigger the entire time. So for transitions, it will load the next area, and for regular triggers, it will activate their usual behavior. So, as you can see here, the Endar Spire exit to the starboard section is right here near the top of the map, and we spawn down here near the bottom of the map. By moving our character next to this piece of rubble right here, in this very precise position, we will be perfectly aligned with the exit door. This will DLZ the door transition, and cause the starboard section to load. We can see range line up and activate this in this clip here. 
Our next glitch to explain is AMG. This one is very important as it will appear throughout the entire run. AMG stands for Anywhere Menu Glitch. This is a modern version of an older piece of tech called the Menu Glitch, which allowed us to glitch menus into letting us move the player character while they're open, and arbitrarily pause and unpause the game at times we shouldn't be able to. I discovered and developed AMG back in mid-2019. There are many ways to get this arbitrary pause control. The method we are discussing relies on the Alt F4 menu. Yes, you heard that right. If you accomplish this glitch, we will be hit pressing Alt F4, where in most games, Alt F4 simply closes the program, and KOTOR hitting Alt F4 opens the pop-up, asking if we are sure we want to quit the game. Opening this menu creates a game pause event. Hitting cancel on this menu does another game pause event, to unpause the game. Another set of actions that pauses and unpauses the game is saves and loads. Whenever we save, the game is paused, data is written to the save file, and then the game is unpaused, and a similar idea goes for loading a save. So, the astute among you will already kind of see where this is going. What if we hit Alt F4 while the game was loading, or saving? Well, that gives us an AMG. While the game is loading, we hit Alt F4. That tries to pause the game, but since the game is already paused because of our loading state, instead unpauses the game. When the load ends, it tries to unpause the game, but since it's already unpaused, it will pause it instead. Now that the load is over and control is returned to the player, we can take actions and even unpause even though the Alt F4 menu is still up. That means we have a way to unpause the game at any time via the cancel button. And you'll soon realize just how incredibly powerful that is. And though we've barely scratched the surface of what AMG has to offer, we really should continue. So while the starboard section is loading, range AMGs by hitting Alt F4 during the load-in. He then cancels, saves, and then loads in quick succession. Canceling during this brief conversation unpauses the game in the background and lets him control his character. Saving and then loading causes the conversation to end early, similar to the hard buffer we did at the start of the run. During the quick load from this brief conversation skip, he AMGs again, unpausing to let himself run with the Alt F4 pop-up in place. Here, gameplay is pretty normal. He takes tight lines and ignores enemies, as he loots the footlocker for a set of computer spikes. This will be the only computer we interact with for the entire run, which is very funny if you've ever played this game before. This cutscene kills the next room of troopers and unlocks the doorway to Karth. On our way, we loot the Sif Commander for the prototype Vibroblade. What is usually a starter weapon for the first planet will actually be our primary weapon for the entire run. After this, we meet Karf, and now we need to talk about another glitch. So at this point, you're probably wondering, when are we going to be using this Alt F4 pop-up? Well, that brings us to another AMG trick I discovered. Free look AMGs. So, KOTOR has several cutscenes that are referred to as stunts in the code. These special cutscenes have many different uh, qualities. The most important of these being the scripted dynamic camera movements. And as it turns out, if these camera movements are interrupted, the cutscene will skip to the very last line of dialogue, bypassing most of the waiting. This is accomplished by having an AMG when entering one of these stunt cutscenes. Once in place, one needs only to cancel the Alt F4 pop-up. This unpauses the scene and gives us control of the player character. Then we hit our free look hotkey twice. The free look button puts the camera into first person mode, and is meant for taking pictures and admiring these beautiful graphics in this game. By using it during one of these cinematics, the camera sequence is broken, and the cutscene skips to the very last line. So with that in mind, let's get back to the run. So Range mashes Karf's conversation, and runs to click an escape pod. This loads the dream sequence cutscene, which is a stunt. Now this is a pretty poor example of a free look AMG, as this cutscene is already very short. However, we have measured that this strat saves between one and a half to two whole seconds. So, that sounds like it's worth it to me. As soon as this cutscene ends, range cancels and free looks to break the camera sequence. This moves the camera to the player character who is way out of bounds. During this he also enabled V-Sync. They previously had had it disabled to help with the DLC earlier. This caps the frame rate back to 60, and will make the game much more stable going forward. And with that, the tutorial level, the end our spire, is all done. And it only took us just over a minute. Now let's move on to Terrace.
Terrace is the starting planet in KOTOR. During it, we get our inciting incident, we meet our cast of lovable characters, and the story is set up for the rest of the game. We will be doing none of those things in this run. In this, our longest segment of the run, we will be glitching the game so horribly that it will become almost unrecognizable to a casual agent. In order to get off Terrace, we need to meet several requirements. I find it easiest to think about them in reverse. The only way to get off of Terrace is via the Eppenhawk in Davik's estate. The only way to get to Davik's estate is by getting Candorus to bring you there. In order to get Candorus to bring you there, we must obtain the launch codes from the Governor. In order to get access to Candorus, we must win the Terrace Season Opener Swoop Race. So this puts our current goals at get to and kill the Governor for the launch codes, get to and win the Swoop Race to spawn Candorus. So with that established, let's hop into the run. Arriving on Terrace, our companion Karf tells us to keep a low profile, and begin investigating the whereabouts of Bastila. As I'm sure you've guessed, we'll be doing neither of those things. We take the shortest route through this conversation, equip a pair of swords, and then beeline it for the exit. Karf is force added to our party here, so he'll join us in the South Apartments. As soon as we go through the door, Range hard buffers this cutscene with the Sith Raid, and prepares to do our next high octane glitch, the Fake Level Up. Fake Level Ups, or Flues for short, have been around almost as long as KOTOR has been around. This glitch has many different forms that give vastly different results. The version we'll be seeing in this run is the recently developed Skeleton Fake Level Up, or Skelly Flu for short. The Skelly Flu was discovered and developed in a joint effort between Hotshot Wire and myself. So this is yet another glitch that relies on AMG to function. For this particular flu, we AMG into the player menu with our level up available. We select cancel to unpause the game behind the menu and regain control of our character. We then begin the level up and then swap party leaders. This results in us being able to complete the level up without consuming it, because it attempts to pull the level from our party member's available pool instead of our own. It also lets us get temporary feats that can be made permanent later. Once we have a fake level applied to our character, we can begin taking skeleton levels. This is done by AMGing into the player menu with the level available, and selecting level up and cancel simultaneously. This breaks the level up and allows us to terminate it with the escape key. Skelly levels can be easily chained together by repeatedly AMGing, re-canceling, and redoing these levels, allowing us to simply skip through long gaps of levels. We can also interspace party swap fake level ups between our skeleton levels to obtain certain feats and powers along the way. For a more comprehensive explanation of how this works, check out my numerous different videos on fluing and the various written guides on speedrun.com. Finally, if the player does a real level, the chain of fake levels will be broken and they'll be rewarded with whatever feats and skills they obtained at the last level. Now the goal of this Skelly Flu is to obtain Sneak Attack 9 and Master 2 Weapon Fighting. We are able to get Sneak Attack 9 because we are a scoundrel, and they usually receive this feat at level 17. This will be our main way of dealing damage early in the run. This is done by faking level 2 for 2 Weapon Fighting, chaining Skelly levels until level 5, where we fake for improved 2 Weapon Fighting, followed by another Skelly chain before we finally do a real level at level 17 giving us Master 2 Weapon Fighting and Sneak Attack 9. Now, let's watch Range do this at half speed. So here, you can see him AMG, and then quickly cancel, begin the level up, swap the Karf and get 2 Weapon Fighting. Now he does the brief Skelly chain by repeatedly AMGing and double tapping Escape. Here's the fake level at 5, and now another sequence of Skelly chains. You see, he gets really good rhythm here, and I can't stress how very hard this is. Finally, here's the real level at 16, and just like that, he's done. Now let's see that at full speed without me yapping over it. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. Right. Ready. What? What? Alright, now that we're all powered up, we're ready to go. We run past the NPCs we broke with our buffer, and get ready to do some shopping. During this shopping trip, Range will sell everything he owns, and buy some drugs and a heavy combat suit, really keeping that low profile. While he does this running here, I'll take a moment to mention an important concept, lines. 
It is a general truth for most 3D speed games that the shortest path is usually the fastest, so you'll see range taking a very tight and short lines through this run. On our way across the upper city, we pilot Karth over towards our destination, while the main character takes a detour to buy some more drugs. I'm probably not going to grind too hard today. Maybe try to yes. finish some runs. I don't know. In this shopping trip, he buys 7 alacrity. These stems increase your movement speed significantly, a whole 20%, so he'll try to have them active throughout the whole run. He also buys a stamina and a strength. These will help him in some upcoming combat. He uses the full stem suite, that is an alacrity, a stamina, a strength, and the hyper battle stem he brought from Lareem, on the main character immediately, as well as a single alacrity stem on Karf, so that they both have the same improved movement speed. There's actually an important yet quite subtle glitch that comes with these stems. This is Duration Glitch. Duration Glitch occurs when passing between levels with status effects active. Due to a poor patch between the Xbox and PC versions, the duration of these active effects is erroneously extended when passing between modules like this. So these stems they have used will be lasting significantly longer than they should. Our next glitch we need to discuss is the Gather Your Party Warp, also called GP Warps or just GIP Warps for short. Gip warps are yet another AMG glitch that was discovered by myself. They allow us to warp around party members in predictable patterns. But first, some background. Most load zones in KOTOR are designed such that you cannot pass through them if your active party members are not within range of you, resulting in a brief dialogue stating, you must gather your party before venturing forth. To the casual player, this may seem unhelpful, but there is something subtle that happens during this dialogue that is very important. You see, when you run into the load zone, the player is now standing inside of the trigger area. But if they aren't transitioned to the next module, they will need to be moved out of this area. The developer's solution to this problem was to teleport the player out of the trigger area. As a matter of fact, what the script does is find the nearest waypoint titled K Transabort and teleports the current party leader to that location when the dialogue is concluded. And so the astute amongst you will already see where this is going. By AMGing this dialogue, we can change the party leader before the teleport occurs, warping the party leader to the nearest K-transabort waypoint. Now, particularly sweaty speedrunners can take this glitch one step further, by not AMGing the load zone, but buffering it instead, swapping the instant the dialogue is triggered, which is a good deal more difficult than the former, but has potential to be ever so slightly faster. We call those buffered gips. So for this upper city gip, the main character is here, in Zelka's shop, and Karf is waiting by the upper city north load zone, right here. Karf will move into the load zone here, triggering the gather party dialogue. The party leader will be swapped to the main character, who will end the dialogue and get teleported to the waypoint right here. Now, since range is a beast, he activates the gip with the buffered method, like we were discussing before. And just like that, the main character is warped over and we're ready to keep moving. But if you thought there was time to breathe, well, you're mistaken, because it's already time for yet another glitch. And this one is a doozy. It's time for our first Hot Shots. Hot Shots are a set of glitches discovered by Hotshot Wire and workshopped by both me and him. They come in many different forms, though for now we'll just be discussing Autosave Hot Shots. Autosave Hot Shots allow us to warp our party members between any two autosave locations, without losing any save data, even if these locations have not been visited before, though most of these benefits are rather moot as the rule set prevents us from using pre-made saves. Regardless, they also have one additional side effect, in that the player will spawn in the default module warp location when an autosave hotshot is utilized. This is what we will be abusing for this run. So an autosave hotshot is accomplished by AMGing into the options menu, selecting cancel and load game simultaneously to gain player control while the load game menu is opened. When this load menu is opened, the metadata for the current existing autosave is pulled from storage and kept in memory. This includes information such as the save title and time played, but most importantly it includes the destination module. With this set up, we simply need to pass through another transition that will result in an autosave. This overwrites the old autosave on the disk. However, the metadata for this old autosave is still present in memory, 
and will be used if we execute a load from our glitched menu. So once this overwrite has happened, we simply load the autosave, and we'll load into that location with the party and save data from the new autosave. And, most importantly, we'll spawn in the default warp location for that module. Now for this autosave hotshot here in the upper city north, we'll be taking advantage of this very convenient default spawn location, right here. This is clear on the opposite side of the module, and cuts out a great deal of walking from the route. Better yet, both the Upper City North and Upper City South are auto-saving modules, so it is sufficient to just turn around immediately upon entering in order to set up the auto-save hotshot. It's very convenient. So let's watch it. So you see here, range AMGs on the load-in. He immediately spins around and opens the door of Karth. While it opens, he opens the option menu and cancels into the load game menu like we discussed. Since they now have control of the player, they just walk forward to trigger the new autosave. Now before the game even fades in, he immediately loads the autosave, and voila, they spawn across the map, right where we need to be for our next DLZ. But before he does that, he makes a hard save here in the upper city for a special trick that will come up later. So as we discussed earlier, we need to get into the Sith base to obtain the launch codes so we can leave this planet. And given the option of going through the needlessly convoluted series of events that usually would result in having us break into the Sith base, we just randomly teleport into it without explanation instead. For this DLZ, we line up against this dividing wall right here, near where we spawned. Just as with the Spire DLZ, you can see we are lined up precisely with the X coordinate of one of the door's edges. And we're positioned in the negative Y direction. So it's just a matter of using the wall to slow our movement speed. Side note, your movement speed is multiplied by the sine of the angle between the wall's normal vector and the player's movement vector. This makes walls very effective for slowing down player speed, therefore making DLZs easier. And moving into the DLZ location so that we hit it. This DLZ can be a real run killer, but as you'll see, range gets it very quickly. Freaking go. Now inside of the Sith base, we need to make our way to the governor's office, because our idea of keeping a low profile is immediately murdering a government official a mere two minutes after our arrival on the world. There's also a lot of subtle movement things Range does here, such as running during the fade-in and taking good lines around these edges. They make their way around and enter the barracks to acquire the pass for the elevator, we used to use the computer to open the elevator, but recent route optimizations mean acquiring the necessary computer spikes is just unreasonable. He does a hard buffer to skip past the assault droid cutscene and enters the elevator to the governor's office. Now before we can continue, we need to introduce another glitch. Wire targeting. Wire targeting is a remarkably simple glitch that frequently players will do by accident, usually in its simpler forms, in casual play. It was named after its discoverer, Hotshot Wire, who worked out how to do the bulk of the glitch, and I figured out why it worked, and how to make it predictable. So, at any given moment, the player character is targeting some object. The object being targeted is represented as a number in memory, a 16-bit short for my computer science nerds. So naturally, whenever you switch targets, this value swaps to one corresponding to that object in question. However, this value is stale whenever the player character first loads in, and is very slow to update. As a result, you can interact with and target objects in ways you shouldn't be able to for this brief period after a load-in. The way in which the player interacts with an object is based on the kind of object they were targeting before the load-in. So for instance, if you were targeting a hostile enemy before the load-in, and then spam attack during the window after the load-in, you'll attack whatever new object you're targeting, even if it isn't hostile. So with that explained, let's see how we use this. This instance is very simple, because we're using the governor to wire target the governor, so we already know that they share a numeric value. We simply quick save while he's passive, and then trigger his conversation to make him hostile. Once he's targeted, we load the save and spam attack. This will cause us to begin safely stabbing him in the back. Now, the reason we do this is because the Vanilla Governor fight is, frankly speaking, ass. He has a tendency to stun the player, and he has a suite of force powers that are just annoying enough to make this fight just really not worth doing legitimately. And we need to kill him, so that we can get the launch codes off of his body. Anyway, let's watch Range pull this off. 
He buffers in to keep his conversation from occurring and going hostile early, gets behind him in a prime backstabbing position, and then lets the conversation start. And then he wire targets his ass. Now even with our high sneak attack damage, this fight can still be tough because the governor's armor class is high, so it takes a few hits before range finally gets a solid lucky hit and loots the launch codes off of his corpse. With that out of the way, we need to get back to the upper city, and to do that, we're going to do another hotshot. This time, this will be a quick save hotshot. So a quick save hotshot is admittedly much more useful than autosave hotshots, as they let us arbitrarily warp to any module that we've been to before, so they're great for backtracking, which is exactly what we're doing here. So at first glance, quick save hotshots seem quite complicated, but they're actually pretty simple. First of all, we need a quick save in our destination. With that in place, we can simply A and G, open the options menu, and select cancel and load game simultaneously. This enters the load game menu while still allowing us to control our character. Now, recall from the earlier hotshot explanation that when the load game menu is opened, the information about each save is pulled into memory, including the destination module. So when we open this menu, we have a quick save that will attempt the load in the destination module. But since we have control of the player, we can overwrite this quick save by hitting the quick save button. We are now replacing the file that the quick save slot on the menu is pointing to with our current player location. However, since we never closed the menu, it will still try and load us in the destination module. So we can simply load the save, and the game will take us to the quick save we just made. But place our character in the destination module instead of the actual location, therefore warping the player to this new location. So that explanation out of the way, let's see what range does. First of all, we need a quick save in the destination module, in this case in the upper city north. So he doesn't lose his progress here, he makes a hard save in the governor's office that he can come back to later. Then he loads the save in the upper city north they made earlier on the run. There, Range makes a quick save, and then loads the hard save back in the governor's office. During the load-in, he AMGs, opens the options menu, cancels and selects load game simultaneously, pulling the upper city north save info. He then overwrites the quick save, notice the load option still shows the info for the old quick save despite him just making one. He then loads the save, and voila, we're in the upper city in our last location. Now let's see that again, but at full speed. But it could have been even worse, so we'll, we're fine with it. Now in the upper city again, it's time to head to the lower city. And what better way to get down there but with another DLC. This one is very similar to the Sith based DLC, but noticeably easier because of some fascinating logic behind the way floating point values work. I'll link an article in the description for those interested. You can see we line up with this elevator door right here, and we use the railing of the upper city to reduce our speed. Listen to me! Getting the DLZ quickly, Range then makes his way into the lower city, without any hesitation. He hard buffers past a long cutscene right here, and beelines it for the Volcar base. Now, usually there's a lot of steps you have to go through to get into the Volcar base, but lucky for us, we have glitches! Getting into the Volcar base is a combo of two glitches, a DLZ and an old style clip. I'm not going to dwell into old style clips for too long, all you really need to know is that saving and loading your doors with party members around can cause you to clip into them. So we position Karth in such a way that when a save and load occurs, we'd clip into the door of the Volcar base. Now it just so happens that when in solo mode, the position the game tries to put the player in when we clip into this door, with Karth standing in this very precise position here, is exactly lined up with the X coordinate of this door. This causes us to DLZ into the Volcar base. Sheesh. That's cool. Yes. <laughs> Thermal detonator. I probably should have used it differently. 
Now, if you happen to blink here, it will look like after all this work of clipping into this place, he just turns around and leaves. But if you look very closely, you'll see that he quick saves inside of here. This quick save will be held on to until the end of this segment, so that we can use it for a hotshot later. Leaving the Volker base, we're going to make our way to the Beck base, and for the first time in several minutes, we're finally just doing some regular old running. And just as you get a little comfortable, it's time for another DLZ. So here's uh, one of the new DLZs. I'm about to try it. Hopefully I can get it pretty nice. Yeah, that's Lahan. It's right here. There we go. This DLZ is barely worth it. Only <laughs> crazy bastards like range go for it. As you can see, we're about 20 meters from the back base, and nicely lined up with its X coordinate. He just has to grind up against this polygon vertex right here to get in. What? Now that we're inside, we're DLZing again. They do this one with Karth because due to a party member positioning bug, this will allow us to spawn behind Gaddon in the upcoming fight. As you can see, we're positioned right here, and the door to Gaddon's office is located right down here. This DLZ is effectively sequence breaking past about half of the terrace plot. The goal of killing Gaddon here is to set the variable in the Volcar base to get Kandon to bring us to the swoop race. You know, the swoop race, we need to get to the spawn Kanderas who will get us off world. Keep up, keep up. Because Karth activated this transition, we spawn behind Gaddon, so we're ready to stab him. It's worth noting we only have to kill Gaddon and not his bodyguard here. Ready. Some good luck and a nutty sneak attack means Gaddon dies instantly, which concludes what is basically the last fight in the run in our very combat heavy game. Now, we need to get back to the Volcar base. Luckily, we still have the quick save we made there less than a minute ago. So it's as simple as getting an AMG, which he does while making a useless hard save, and executing a quick save hotshot to get back to the Volcar base. Blink and you'll miss it. Yeah, it's actually very consistent. It's super nice. And... Alright, Star Wars fans. It's time for everyone's favorite high-speed racing sport. Pod, um, I mean, swoop racing. Arriving here in the Volker base, Candon will just magically know that Gavin's dead and spit some bars while we try to mash past his conversation. Uh, we still have to run to the cantina anyway. So, it'll be interesting. Yeah, any percent is crazy. It's actually really fun. I would highly recommend it to anyone. Um, you know, grinding out a really good time is hard, for sure, because of the... Arriving at the swoop head, range immediately hard buffers to skip the introduction conversation with the mechanic. In casual play, the goal is to win two races, so we get the prize, a plot-important character slash community waifu. But we don't really care about that. We just need the game to think we've won two races, so we can leave and get off-world. Plot and waifus be damned. The first bit of swoop race tech we need to talk about is the shift trick. Due to a bug in the boost pad code for the Terra swoop race, if we shift into the highest gear, boost pads will stop working, and therefore, at lower speeds, shifting to the final gear is actually a net time loss. Side note, this only really applies to Terrace. So to avoid this, you'll see range avoid shifting into the last gear during this race. Another trick you'll notice is that range carries an AMG into the swoop race. This allows us to skip our second race. You see, after we finish the first race, a variable is set saying that we've just won. This starts a conversation with the mechanic that advances our competition progress. Using this AMG, we can cancel this conversation after our progress has been advanced, but before this variable is set back to false. After which we can simply speak to the mechanic again, and they'll believe that we've won a second race. Now let's sit back, relax, and watch some racing. It's still possible. They're still a little inconsistent, but definitely not the worst thing in the speedrun I've ever seen. And this run is just so fun, like lots of great menuing, you get to do like a really cool fake level up, you get to do a routine. Uh, those are some really intense menuing sections that are really fun. Like. I'm about that. Right? Skelly Blue is great. Routine, fake level up, 
tons of DLZs. Yeah, interview's great too. Racing. And with that race over and the AMG done, we talk to the mechanic again. Halfway through this conversation, it actually switches from one dialogue file to another, so we can actually buffer during this break, which Range does. But instead of loading, he saves the game and loads in the lower city autosave that was made earlier. There, he quick saves, setting up for another quick save hotshot. Completing this hotshot, they end up back where they left off in the lower city, right next to Javier's Cantina, where Candorus will be waiting for us. So before we continue on, I'd just like to acknowledge just how off the rails we've gotten here. Of the five party members you usually acquire on Terrace, we've only obtained one so far. We skipped past about 90% of the main quest, and two of the plot beats we do. We did in reverse order. We did not rescue Basila, we never visited half the modules, and we have zero plot motivation. This is perfect. But of course, all we have to do to get off-world is to have Candorus bring us to Davik's base. And all we need to do for that is to have Candorus, who spawned when we won the swoop race, and the launch codes, which we stole from the governor we murdered. So with that, we're ready to wrap up Terrace. So he runs in and he talks to Candy Boy, who is entirely unfazed by the fact that we've already had the item he was looking for, despite us only just meeting. After mashing through this conversation, we get to have a plot cutscene. Nah, I'm just kidding, we're skipping over glitches. Remember, uh, free look AMG from earlier? Yep, we got another stunt cutscene, and this one is much longer. So that's where this glitch really shines. The Terrace Destruction Order's cutscene is usually over a minute, but by breaking the camera sequence with a free look AMG, we're able to skip the last line of dialogue. You also get to see the player running around on the Leviathan, because we like to have fun. Pretty good run. We like it. Now before you get the opportunity to catch your breath, we have to do another AMG as Davik Space loads in. You see, usually when we arrive in Davik Space, he gives us a tour of the facility, takes us to our room where we have to go through a chaotic firefight in the gangster space to escape with a ship, but since we AMG'd on the way in, we gain control of our character during this conversation. Particularly, we cancel the conversation when he shows us his prized starship, the Ebon Hawk, which we proceed to steal right in front of his face, in the middle of our tour. It's very rude. So. Nah, I started with NMG. I think it's a great category to start with. Now we're quite literally seconds away from Terrace being over, but before it ends, we have to discuss one more glitch. Map CS skips. Yes, I know, I'll make it quick. So map CS skips were discovered by the legend, Glasnok, early on in his speed game's history. And they work just like they sound, you use the map to skip a cutscene. You see, the map has a rapid transit feature that lets you fast travel to the Evan Hawk at certain points in the game, and it just so happens the developers forgot to disable this during most of the stunt modules, which is a logical oversight seeing as we shouldn't be able to use our map in the first place. But if you happen to click it in the about 20 frame window before the cutscene starts, you'll be able to fast travel, which will skip past the cutscene and place you at the Ebonhawk for the current planet. It just so happens that using the Ebonhawk in Davik space sets our current planet variable to Dantooine, so doing a map CS skip here skips past all three cutscenes and plot points, and just sticks us on the next world, ready to continue on for the second half of our run, and do some more glitches. So before we can start up Dantooine, we need to talk about dialogue cues. You may have heard me mention this earlier during the hard buffer explanation. The dialogue queue is a data structure that stores the next dialogue file that the game is preparing to serve to the player. There can only be one dialogue file queued at once, so by preventing a cutscene from starting, we can also prevent other dialogues from being loaded in. The way we usually do this is by abusing a party member. Whenever you click on a player with a party member, their dialogue file is placed in the dialogue queue. However, the game will not start the conversation until they close the distance to you, so we can hold the conversation in the queue by simply running away. This also has the added benefit of keeping our party member from falling behind. So after Range mashes Bastl's conversation, yeah, she just kind of appears here even though we didn't save her, don't worry about it, he uses Candorus to dialogue queue his way through the Jedi Enclave. 
He actually messes this up a bit the first try, causing Candorus to enter his conversation. So he's able to quickly recover and do it on the second try. Luckily, Bastila opens most of these doors for us, and Belaya doesn't bother us either because, you know, the dialogue cue. And we actually get to achieve the dream of so many casual players, and beat Bastila to the council chamber. However, we won't be talking to the Jedi Council. You see, usually we go through a series of trials, and become trained as a Jedi, and get given a mission to save the galaxy, but we'd rather ignore all of that. So instead, we're just gonna break out of the Enclave the only way we know how, with a DLZ. The Enclave DLZ is pretty simple. We just run our player into this corner right here, and that lines us up with this exit here, which allows us to exit through this usually locked door. Notice that he disables V-Sync for the faster frame rate, and makes a save for a future hotshot, and then immediately rolls into the DLC. Getting it quite quickly, we transition into the courtyard. Here in the courtyard, we're going to do a couple glitches. First of all, he AMGs on the load-in. Then he opens the map, and clicks the Return to Ebonhawk button. This results in what we call a pop-up replacement. This particular one is a form of a trick we call the Fast Lane, which we'll be describing in more detail soon. With this pop-up in place, and control of his character regained, he dialogue cues Candorus onto him to avoid the cutscenes with John and the Cath Hounds. With this in place, he runs directly for the ancient ruins, hugging this wall right here to avoid a brief cutscene. Thanks, build. Heck yeah. It's pretty cool. Was a good run. The only time loss that I actually, like, basically if I hadn't lost the time on deck one of Starforge, I wouldn't still be doing runs. Because it was a very good run. Now let's talk more about fast lanes. Fast Lane was discovered by me, Lane. However, for the record, I did not come up with the name. You have Glasnock to thank for that one. Fast Lanes are performed by pop-up replacing the Return to Ebonhawk pop-up, allowing you to return to the Ebonhawk in places you wouldn't usually be able to. The important feature of this trick is that the pop-up can be carried through loads, meaning that you can essentially return to the Ebonhawk from anywhere provided you have a save that you can get the pop-up from. Another added benefit of being able to return to the Ebonhawk anywhere is slight angle clipping, a bit of tech found by Glasnock that allows us to clip past most doors using fast travels. This is done by simply placing the main character near a door at a specific angle, a slight angle, and then fast traveling back and forth. This will spawn a party member behind the door, effectively clipping past it. So, positioning his player near the door at this specific angle, using the fast lane pop-up we got earlier to return to the hawk, and then transiting back, Range is able to spawn Candorus behind the door. With Candorus back there, we're now in position to DLZ into the ruins. This DLZ is rather unusual because of how close we are to the door, and how little room there is back there. Though, if you look here, this spot is just in the right position to line up with the edge of the door right here, and activate the transition. And as you can see, after a moment of grinding against the wall, he's able to activate this DLZ pretty quickly and get in. Alright, we're in the ruins. Now what? Well, had we done any of the plot at all, we would have been eventually ordered to explore these ruins. This is usually the last thing that occurs on Dantooine, so by clipping here, we're effectively skipping the entire planet. When we enter, Basila is force added to our party. This is quite funny, as we've only spoken to her once the entire game, and we ignored everything she said. So, she's essentially just a stranger that has appeared out of nowhere. We move into the main chamber and hard buffer a long conversation with this ancient droid. It's okay, I'm sure he didn't have anything important to say anyway. The droid is gonna make us do a puzzle, but we decided to just glitch to the end of the dungeon instead, using yet another DLZ. For the first time I'll run, we're actually not DLZing a transition, but instead we're activating a regular old trigger. This one activates the conversation with this thing called a star map. We simply need to achieve an X coordinate that is slightly past the surface of this door. We achieve this by just blindly running into it. Range AMG is before doing this DLZ because he's going to want to break out of the cutscene it's going to trigger. The preferred method of doing this one is to face away from the bulk of the map, as this increases the frame rate due to the uh, culling of the, you know, 3D objects behind him. 
As soon as the cutscene starts and the map is activated, we can go ahead and cancel and break the cutscene with a save and a load. So what was all of this about? Well, the goal for the mid-game, or the creamy middle as the developers like to call it, is to obtain five of these star maps in order to unlock the unknown world and progress to the end of the game. Whenever one of these star maps is acquired, a global variable, an 8-bit byte, entitled K star map is incremented by 10. Once this value hits 50, the end game is unlocked. Triggering the cutscene here in the ruins of Dantooine is all we needed to do to increment the value to 10. The same script also set up the Jedi Council for their final conversation. So all we need to do to be able to leave Dantooine is just talk to them and get our ship unlocked. So in order to get back to the Council, we're going to do a hot shot using that sneaky save range made earlier while he was doing the Enclave DLC. This hotshot is a little bit different from the other ones we've seen. This is a hard save hotshot, sometimes called an old style or main menu hotshot. The reason we don't use a quick save hotshot here is because our main character fast laned earlier, placing their last location next to the Ebonhawk. And since hotshots always found the player in their last location, we'd have to walk in across the entire module again. Luckily, there is a workaround that only works with hard save hotshots. For reasons that aren't entirely clear, when doing hard save hotshots, if your party member's coordinates are placed out of bounds, they end up spawning adjacent to the player location in the previous save, whereas newer quick save hotshots will spawn them next to the player's new location. As a result, when doing a hard save hotshot, Bastla will spawn back with the council where the save was made. So, we see range hard save in the ruins, and load his save in the enclave. Once there, he quick saves and AMGs, opens the options menu, and then pop-up replaces the exit game button. This means that when he selects OK, the main menu will be open. He selects OK and save game simultaneously, causing the main menu to be opened with the save game menu behind it. You'll recall that since the save game menu was opened, it will have pulled the data from all of the hard saves, including their module locations. By pressing the down arrow once, he selects the hard save he made in the menu behind the main menu. He then selects enter, which opens a new load game menu over the still existent save game menu. This causes the file descriptors for these save games to be shifted down by one, meaning the quick save save info is pointing to the hard save that was made in the ruins. When he loads this quick save, it's going to load the save made in the ruins, but with the location set to the council, thus completing the hotshot. Probably right here too. Without hesitation, he swaps the Bastila and books it for the council. Vandar has one preliminary conversation to get out of the way before he'll trigger the Dantooine end conversation. Clicking on him with Bastila will actually swap him with the main character, after which he mashes through the convo. Clicking Vandar a second time triggers the Dantooine end cutscene, which we mashed through very briefly. After this, we save and then load. This resets the module to late game Dantooine and allows us to use the fast travel feature. So by returning to our last transit point, which was in the courtyard by the ruins, and then immediately returning to the Ebonhawk, we are warped straight to our ship, ready to leave. We board the ship and head straight for the galaxy map, our means of traveling the galaxy. The next and only planet that we'll be heading to for the mid-game is Kashyyyk, or Kashyyyk if you prefer the new canon, home of the Wookiees. For this, we'll be doing another map CS skip, like the one we did when we left Dantooine. You'll notice that after the CS skip, we end up back on Dantooine. This is because our current planet variable was never updated. However, the cutscene was skipped, so it's only a matter of CS skipping again to end up on Kashyyyk. Side note, you may notice that the stems we used on Terrace still haven't run out. Duration glitch in action. And we're on Kashyyyk. Now, I'm sure some of you are wondering, why Kashyyyk? Well, there are a few reasons. Reason 1, there's a special friend waiting for us here, Jolie Bindu, who is a plot-important character that we need in order to avoid a soft lock near the end of the game. Reason 2, getting to the star map here is very quick due to some convenient positioning for a few glitches. And reason 3, Wookiees are just cool. So the first thing you'll notice when we exit the Hawk is that Range has added Bastila to his party. This is because our other two party members, Karth and Candorus, actually broke on Dantooine during some of the glitches. And therefore, Bastila is the only one we can add to our party, and of course, we need a party member to pull off a few glitches here. 
Before the fade-in, he swaps to and moves Basla during the 50-ish frames before the conversation of Janos starts. He mashes through this conversation and then dialogue cues Basla onto a Zerker guard that will move her just far enough away from the player to trigger a Gip Warp. Remember Gip Warps? As soon as she's in that range, range moves into the Hawk trigger and triggers the Gip dialogue. As you can see from this map, Basla has to get past this point right here in order for the Gip to take her to the Great Walkway entrance over here, rather than the Ebonhawk. And so you can see here that he runs her just past that point before clicking the dialogue option to warp her to the exit. He then moves Basla slightly backwards to trigger the guard conversation. This warps our player to Basla's location, so we can move on. Now before we progress to the Great Walkway, we need to talk about another glitch. Yeah, it never really ends with this game. Okay, so you know hotshots, right? Pretty broken, huh? Well, they're about to get even more broken. If you recall earlier during the Dantooine hotshot explanation, I offhandedly mentioned that this idea of party members spawning out of bounds, but I didn't really elaborate. You see, whenever you perform a hotshot, while the main character is put in their last recorded location, other party members are actually placed in the coordinates in the destination that match those from their origin save, except for when they're placed out of bounds, of course. That means if we plan our party members' locations cleverly, we can use them to spawn in advantageous locations after hotshots. We call this effect coordinate warping. So it just so happens that this spot behind the guard matches up quite well with a spot halfway across the Great Walkway, as you can see by these maps. So all he has to do is stick his nose through the door, he quick saves, spins around, shoves Basil into position, and he just does a regular old hotshot like so. We're gonna get in time here because I messed this up. Next up, we have Basila halfway across the walkway, but we need to get her all the way to the elevator to get into the Shadowlands. Luckily, this coordinate warp placed us in just the right location for her to get to the elevator. As you can see by this map, she is well within the range of the transport waypoint. And since the main character's last location is by the entrance, range need only AMG and spin around to get Basila. Another nice thing about this trick is that since the elevator is not triggered by a regular transition, the main character doesn't need to be anywhere near Basila in order for range to use the elevator. So after he enters the Shadowlands, they immediately AMG and cancel. This allows them to control their character during Kalonord's conversation. Kalonord was a character we were supposed to meet earlier and who was hunting us across the galaxy. We're going to leave him on red. Since we're in a conversation, we can't be attacked by these Katarn, which have a good chance to kill us due to the fact that we're only a level 2 scoundrel right now. After we squeeze past them, we end the conversation with a save and a load, and then AMG again to deal with Joe Lee's conversation, during which we continue to move. This conversation needs to get just far enough such that Joe Lee will believe that we've already met and gone to his house. With Joe Lee conversation terminated, Range uses solo mode to leave Bastila with the old man, so that she can talk to him and turn his quest in in a moment. What can I do? What? Ah. Range runs over to a group of some corporate poachers to go commit some casual eco-terrorism by shutting off one of the only protection systems they have against being eviscerated by the hazardous forest life He's able to do this by using a silver tongue, the measly 10 charisma we took a character at creation, to talk the guards into giving him the codes to shut down these emitters. After he buffers the following cutscene, he swaps to Bachelor to go tell Joe Lee that we took care of the poachers. Because this conversation is meant to be had with the main character, he gets swapped into Bachelor's position, and Bachelor gets placed back over by the poacher camp. After chatting with Joe Lee, he decides to join our merry band. We keep Bachelor in the party so that we can swap back to her. This is great because the location we left her in is already halfway to the exit. After doing all of this, we finally have a moment to breathe, as for the first time in nearly 10 minutes, all we have to do is run with the character. During this brief moment, I'm going to shout out our Discord server. The KOTOR speedrunning community is an open and welcoming group that loves to have new members. Whether you're interested in running, watching, or just chatting about Star Wars, we're happy to have you, and you can find a link to that in the video description. Now that we're in the lower Shadowlands, it's time for me to introduce one more new glitch. This is the last one, I promise. Okay, so I'll be real, this one is a doozy. It's time for us to talk about the routine. 
One of the most infamous glitches in the modern route, the routine was discovered by Hotshot Wire, and as usual, the mechanics regarding why this glitch works were discovered by me. So put simply, the routine is a glitch that allows us to delete all of the content in our current save except for the module we're currently standing in, our inventory, quest log, set variables, and the party members that are accompanying us. Before we can go into how we accomplish this, we need to explain the mechanics behind a few game features. Inside the game's working directory, a folder called SW Kotor, lies two other directories, Current Game and Game in Progress. Current Game stores the data for the currently loaded module. This information is often redundant with the data that's stored in memory. Game in Progress stores all of the other content in the save, party members who are present, data in other modules, and other save features that do not need to be currently loaded into memory. Now whenever the player saves the game, the current module data loaded into memory is loaded and written to an encapsulated resource file in the current game folder. The game then also generates a new creature blueprint files for all active party members, as well as a file containing the current values of all global variables. All of these files are then combined with the contents of game in progress, and packaged into a save game, along with an info file that holds the usual metadata about a save, including its name and last locations. Another important thing to know is that these folders, game in progress and current game, are emptied whenever the game is exited, or, crucially, when a new game is started. With all of this in mind, it's time to discuss the mechanics behind a routine. When performing this glitch, we glitch the main menu into allowing us to start a new game while a previous game is running in the background, allowing us to make a save while both the current game and game in progress folders have been emptied, meaning that we obtain a save containing only the save data that was currently loaded into memory. The way we execute this is as follows. First we make an AMG with a quick save and the module we want to keep. Then we open the options menu and pop up replace the exit game button. This will mean that the main menu will be opened when selecting OK. So we do that while simultaneously selecting load game. This opens a load game menu behind the main menu, kind of like with the main menu hotshot we did earlier. We hit the down arrow once, which selects us on the autosave. We then hit enter to both open another load game menu on the main menu, and select the autosave for loading. It's crucial that we use an autosave here, because autosaves use a different loading script than traditional saves, which allows us to avoid a crash here in a moment. We select OK, which loads the autosave we hit enter on, which then allows us to re-enter the game with control of our character. However, notice that this autosave we loaded was on our first load game menu we opened, and not the one that was opened from the main menu. So after the game loads in, and we quick load to get back to our save that we want to keep, you'll see that the load game menu is still open, and since it was opened on the main menu, when we select cancel, the main menu reopens, while the game is still running in the background. Now we just have to tap one of the main menu hotkeys a few times to regain control of our characters. And then, we can select the new game button. This, as we discussed before, deletes all of the contents of the current game and game in progress folders. But since we still have control of our player, we can still hit quick save, allowing us to create a save containing only the data currently loaded into memory. With that, it is sufficient to return to the main menu, hit the options hotkey to open the options menu behind the main menu, and then select up and enter. What that does is that's clicking the exit game button in our currently running instance, and it'll allow us to terminate the game that's running in the background, and load the new save without crashing, because the game isn't like having two instances running at the same time. The save we load is the cursed quick save we made earlier, and voila, you've just deleted the entire contents of your save, except for the reality that the player currently existed in. But now I'm sure you're wondering, why the hell would I ever want to do any of that? Well brace yourself, because things are about to get more complicated. This next section is what I like to call The Monster, and it is a beautiful culmination of so many different glitches, and is representative of years of glitch hunting progress between Hotshot Wire, myself, and several other community members. You see, whenever we routine, our global variables are not updated. This includes k underscore star underscore map, a variable we discussed earlier. But what is lost is the maps that you've obtained so far meaning that we can acquire a map, leave the module it's in, routine, and then go back and acquire it again, effectively duplicating star maps. So now we're going to outline how range does this on Kashyyyk. This trick will feature 8 fast lanes, 4 hotshots, and 3 routines, all done in quick, incomprehensible succession. First, I'm going to outline what all is going to happen with a few graphics, and then I'll take you step by step through Ranger's footage. 
So when he arrives in the Lower Shadowlands, he is going to fast lane back to the Ebon Hawk, and then hotshot slash coordinate warp his party members from the landing pad back to the Lower Shadowlands, which will spawn them right next to the star map. He then sets up another fast lane, the Bastila, and then runs her towards the map which he activates. Since it's the first time interacting, she'll have to do the computer puzzle. After it's activated, he can use the fast lane to go back to the landing pad where he can do a routine. This will delete the module data in the Lower Shadowlands and everywhere else. He can then hotshot and coordinate warp and fast lane back into the Lower Shadowlands, allowing Bastlip to obtain the map again, where she can fast lane back and rinse and repeat. He's going to keep repeating this until we get a grand total of 5 star maps, including that one star map we got back on Dantooine. So, let's watch him do this. He fast lanes to the landing pad, where he AMGs on a hard save and quick save hotshots to the lower Shadowlands. Before the fade-in even happens, he's going to set up another fast lane. Bastila runs to and selects the map. The computer puzzle is 1322-1151414141. If my roommates are watching this, yes, that number is exactly what you think it is. The star map is activated, and he activates the fast lane to skip the animation and return to the landing pad. He then quick save AMGs again to start the routine. Exit game and load game to get the load menu behind the main menu down and enter to load the autosave. He quick loads immediately after the load in. They hit cancel and re-enter the main menu. New game, which deletes the save data. Quick save to make the curse save. Return to the main menu. Open the options menu behind the main menu with a hotkey. Select exit game to terminate the game running in the background. And finally, load the cursed quick save. Back in the game, he AMGs and Papa replaces Transit back to fast lane quick save hotshot combo, fast traveling and opening the load game menu simultaneously. He then quick saves and loads the misdirected quick save, which to quick save hotshot him back to the landing pad, re adding the lower Shadowlands to the pool of available modules so that he can hotshot again. He then simply quick saves and loads again, which hotshot can warn it warps his party members back to the star map where they can obtain it again, and then fast lane back out. And so he's going to repeat the rest of this twice more to obtain a total of 5 star maps, including the one from Dantooine. While he's routining in the background, I just want to say that this game has other, less complicated categories to try out if this is a bit of a turnoff for you. Some of them include no major glitches, or NMG for short, that remove rule DLZs, AMGs, door clips, and the like. We also have a glitchless rule set, which is even more pure gameplay. But there's basically, there's something for everybody out there, so don't feel too scared away by how complicated this is all seeming. Not to mention, you don't really have to understand how these glitches work in order to do them. Plenty of our runners just take them at, you know, face value and go on faith that they're gonna work and have a great time of the run. And with all of that finally over, we can fast lane back to the landing pad and leave Kashyyyk for good. Note that this just effectively skipped three whole planets and the entire Leviathan sequence. At this point, the story has lost all logic and sense of continuity, and things are only going to start making even less sense. So, as we get onto the Ebon Hawk, we move towards the galaxy map, still with our increased movement speed from our Alacrity Stin that still hasn't run out since Terrace. On the map, you'll notice that inexplicably, a new planet is available. This is the Unknown World, also known as the Starforge System, also known as Rakata Prime, also known as Lehan. And after all of this nonsense, we're entering the endgame, a mere 15 minutes into our playthrough. Some things to note, we're still only a level 2 scoundrel. We are not a Jedi. Our only party members are Bastila and Jolie, as everybody else was deleted when we did our first routine. The only mid-game planet we ever went to was Kashyyyk, and we didn't even do the main quest there. Now, we're moving into the endgame, and there's more glitches to come. Luckily, all of the coming glitches have been explained before, so this ending should be much easier to digest. 
Okay, so first off, this route relies on us taking the dark side ending, because Karth was eliminated from existence entirely during the routine, and we need uh, one of these party members, either Basila or Karth, in order to progress to the end end game. And so in order for Basila to not be completely useless on Starforge, we don't actually uh, CS skip this cutscene before the Leviathan. Instead, we're going to free look AMG it, like we did with the dream sequence and the terrorist destruction orders. And if you can recall, since it's a stunt module, free looking will skip to the last line of dialogue. Watching this cutscene lets Malik torture Basila and turn her to the dark side, which makes her way more useful. With this cutscene over, we get sent to what I call purgatory. You see, since Karf doesn't exist, this next cutscene instantly breaks, so we have no choice but to fast travel to the Ebonhawk. Returning to the Ebonhawk puts us back on Kashyyyk again, but not to worry, as now that the cutscene is out of the way, we can fly to Lahan with no problems. In fact, since there's no cutscene between these planet transitions, we actually have a 50% chance to get a fighter encounter. And you would think getting a fighter encounter would slow us down, but actually it's quite the contrary, because we can AMG on the load-in. Doing this lets us gain control of the player during the minigame, and then use that fast travel system to take us to the Lahan Ebon Hawk, which cuts out a ton of walking. This also is very important because it's going to let us do a major skip here on the planet. You see, there are actually two different Ebon Hawks in the game, the regular functioning Ebon Hawk and the Lahan Ebon Hawk. The Lahan Hawk requires repairs before you can use the galaxy map, and it also locks us into some plot points. But by getting this fighter encounter, we're able to avoid ever setting foot on the Lahan Evan Hawk. This will come into play later. Now that we're on Lahan, we get to make a run for the temple. This is one of the few regular old sprints left in the game. Once we're in the temple exterior module, Range does a fancy trick. You see, after doing the routine all these times, the game in progress folder still isn't populated correctly, so when Range returns to the Evan Hawk and then transits back to the temple exterior, it treats it as if this is his first time coming here, and therefore it did not save the last location waypoint from the fast travel. Having nowhere to place his character, the game puts him in the default module location, similar to what happened with the autosave hotshot back on Terrace. This effectively teleports him halfway across the map, in a very advantageous position. It teleported him right next to the spot for our next DLZ. This next DLZ will get us into the Temple of the Ancients, which is where we need to go to meet up with Emo Bastila. For this DLZ, we line up with the X coordinate of the loading trigger to the temple by placing the player against this wall right here. This allows us to get inside without doing the quest to lower the force field or engaging with the other slower glitches to clip past it. As you can see, he gets it almost instantly. Upon entering the temple, he swaps to Joe Lee, who is going to set up for our next DLZ. We use Joe Lee here because unlike us, he does not have an alacrity active and therefore has a slower movement speed. This will make the coming DLZ easier. Get ready, because this is our last DLZ of the run, and it just so happens to be the hardest one, which is why we're pulling out all the stops to increase our chances of getting it. First off, as I mentioned, we're using Joe Lee for the slower movement speed. We're also facing away from the bulk of the module, which increases the frame rate due to culling. This position will allow us to DLZ straight into the temple summit, where Darth Waifu is waiting for us. And the major factor that makes this run a world record is just how insanely fast he pulls off this very difficult DLZ. Look at this. And with that, we're on the Temple Summit. And I'm sure some of you are wondering, why? Well you see, in order to progress to the Star Forge, the Master Global Variable needs to be set to its final value of 50. The script that does this is fired by a conversation with Darkseid Basila just outside of the Ebonhawk. In order to get this conversation, we need to obtain her as a party member first. And that's what we endeavor to do here. So, usually Basila tries to attack us up here, but range AMGs beforehand and cancels out of her conversation as soon as the local variable indicating that the first conversation is done has passed. But I love, like, figuring out Come on, ways we to make it fast and easy, I guess. Um... Entering the second conversation, range mashes 2 to select the dark side ending, in which Basila attacks Jolie. Of course, Joey doesn't stand a chance, because Evil Basila is leveled in a way to be appropriate for an in-game character, while Jolie hasn't been leveled at all this entire run. Evil Basila also comes equipped with 10 thermal detonators, which you'll be using for a special trick later on. Lucky for Jolie, he doesn't actually have to die, as now that we have Basila, we can just leave, and we have all we need to get to the Star Forge. To get off of the Temple Summit, we simply fast lane during the fight with Jolie. This puts us back at the beach outside of the Ebonhawk where Range walks forward and triggers the cutscene with Vasla, setting the master variable to 50. 
With this, we don't actually have to listen to anything Vassalo says, so we simply quick save hotshots to the regular Evan Hawk, where he can travel to the Star Forge. Doing this skips a sizable quest where we have to obtain parts to repair our ship and shut down a planetary disruptor field that would prevent takeoff. Back on the Ebon Hawk and ready to head for the Star Forge, we have another cutscene incoming. This one we have to free look AMG, as our planet variable is set to the Star Forge, which doesn't allow fast traveling. This free look AMG skips a whole three and a half minutes of plot expositional cutscene. And with that, we're on Star Forge and ready to finish the game in record time. Wasting no time, Range sprints out of the Ebon Hawk and takes Goth Bastila with him. During this, he also auto levels the main character. This is an optional strat that's going to make the final fight a little bit easier. Finally, he's going to apply a new stim. As you see, the duration glitch in Terrace has finally run out. This time, the one that he applies is just in Hyper Adrenal Alacrity. This is going to increase the player movement speed by about 30%. Stepping out of the Hawk, they have to do a short hard buffer. This gets past a very long cutscene where the Jedi who've already boarded fight with some Sith and get their asses beat. It's not that important. With this out of the way, he then applies a Hyper Adrenal Alacrity stem to Bastila, so that she will also receive the 30% movement speed bonus. The stem will last until the end of the run due to the aforementioned duration glitch. Next up, he enables solo mode. This way Bastila won't be running after the main character when we do this management in a second. The main character is queued onto the door, so they continue to move forward while we swap to Bastila. Bastila spins around and then range AMGs. He then moves her into position to pull up the GIP dialogue. Swapping back to the main character, he again cues them for the next door, so that they continue to move autonomously. Meanwhile, he begins to move Basla forward as well. You know, I'm good at this game, but without like, Chaos and Indy helping me, like teaching me, and then also just answering all of my questions, like, you know, couldn't have done it, literally. Yeah, that's some of DLZ was... The first GIP warp here is positioned just past this door, right here. By selecting the GIP dialogue at this point, the main character is warped halfway across the map to the exit right over here. Once there, Bastila, who is following close behind, is also moved into that position. While this movement is occurring, range AMGs of the main character and triggers another GIP, which in turn is used to warp Bastila at the exit. But I do love this game, I love speedrunning it, I love figuring out how to go fast. I'm here. Sure. Here, a hard save is made for a hotshot that we'll be doing in the near future. Moving on to deck 2, it's a pretty similar story. A brief buffer is done that skips another long cutscene, after which Bastila is left at the door while the main character has movement queued to the next door. Yes? What? Yes? Another Gib warp is activated by Bastila, and Range has her and the main character do simultaneous movement until they reach the Gib spot that is right here. Activating the dialogue option warps the player across the map to the exit over here, a similar maneuver to the previous modules performed, where the main character AMGs at the exit to get the second gift warp off, and Basla is moved into position for the second warp. This allows them to enter into deck three. I'm gonna not be flourishing, but that's okay. Deck 3 starts with a brief hard buffer. It just so happens that Deck 3 has a very similar map to Deck 1, as you can see from this graphic. So naturally, it is very conducive to coordinate warps. We spawn right here when we first enter. Our first course of business is to quick save Hotshot back to Deck 1. This is going to put our main character back into the last position, which if you recall is right here. Basla, however, will be placed in the same coordinates she was in the previous module, which as you can see is way out of bounds. And since she was spawned out of bounds, the game decides to put her next to the player. Next, we're just going to quick save Hotshot back to Deck 3. This puts the main character back by the elevator where they were last in the module, Deck 3. But Basila, on the other hand, is now in bounds and ends up at the same coordinates as on Deck 1. This just happens to be in the meditation chamber. Once we're here, the main character has to AMG to initiate one last gip warp. Basla moves into position here, which warps her to the deck 4 exit over here. Unfortunately, Malik is blocking the way, and we need our main character in order to progress. So Range activates another AMG and disables solo mode. They then walk through the door and trigger a cutscene. 
In this cutscene, Malik starts walking forward by a few steps. This is just enough for us to slip past him, so we can cancel the cutscene right afterwards. This also has the added side effect of warping the main character to our position, because they are meant to be a part of this conversation. The gang's all here, and Range is ready to move his party members into the factory viewing platform with persistence. He takes a deep breath, because it's time for the finale. Alright, so let's pause for a moment and get our bearings. It's been less than 20 minutes since we woke up on the Endark Spire, and Karf told us to keep a low profile. And we're about to enter combat with the most feared Sith Lord in the known galaxy. Not to mention, we aren't a Jedi, and we're only a level 3 scoundrel with starting gear and weaponry. So, naturally, the next question is, how on earth are we expected to take on this scary boy in the next room? Well, lucky us, our evil girlfriend here decided to tag along, and she's packing heat. That's right, Basilek came equipped with a full clip of 10 thermal detonators, which is barely enough to handle Malik's first phase. And we have a special trick up our sleeve to deal with the second phase of the fight. With our confidence restored and our foolhardiness at an all-time maximum, it's time to jump into this fight. Range runs into the arena with an unbridled confidence. He has a nice chat with Malik, which he doesn't bother even listening to because he has a record to get. With a twirl of his saber, Malik starts up the fight. Range's first move is to run away, but that's only for a moment. Once at a safe distance, he and Miss Darkseid over here toss a first pair of grenades. Outstanding shot. The second volley goes just fine, but then disaster! A bolt of lightning from Malik cuts our level 3 character's life short. He will be missed. With that expected turn of events out of the way, it's up to Bastila to finish off Malik. Two, three, and then four grenade volleys later, all with the Sith Lord falling on his butt, the fight is nearly over. With an AMG ready, Malik gets ready to describe his diabolical plan for the second phase of this gripping battle, but he doesn't know we're about to interrupt him halfway through his monologue. Range cancels the AMG at the exact same time he selects the first dialogue option. This cancels the cutscene, but Malik still believes he's been injured and is at the end of a phase, and so he concludes that the second phase has been completed and then surrenders, begging for mercy. When the quick load ends after the cutscene skip, there's a black screen for a moment. Everyone's breath is held. The mouse disappears, and this marks the end of the run. The split button is pressed for the final time. Range's eyes float downwards. 20... 33.79, a new world record. The realization sets in, and then comes the pop-off. Let's fucking go! Oh, oh. oh my god, I can't believe it. Let's go. I'm done. I'm done with the category. Until someone finds another, like, minute of skip. Let's freaking go. I'm done. The words of a person who's been swimming through the hazardous pool of Kosar glitches for weeks at this point. With this new record set, the game has been pushed to a new level. A level of gameplay has been demonstrated not often seen. But as even Range can agree, there will be another record, sooner or later. And that was the Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic Any% Unrestricted Speedrun World Record, as performed by Range and explained by me, Lane. This project was so much more work than I expected, and it was a long time coming, but I am so happy to share this run with others, and get to create something special for a topic that I am so passionate about. Now before you go, I have some people I need to thank. Obviously, I can't thank Range enough for letting me use this footage, completing this run, and just being an all-around awesome dude. I consider him to be a great community member, and an even better friend. Special thanks to Hotshot for discovering a good 50% of the glitches demonstrated today. Special thanks to Lopix for his tireless work with development of DLZ tech. Basically all of the DLZs in this run were discovered and workshopped by Lopix. Thanks to Indy Kenobi, who is a legend in his own right, and is responsible for a good portion of this route, and is also a major staple of the Kotor community, about whom things would be much, much different. Thanks to Chaos Drifter for being a chill dude, great friend, and an awesome runner. His competition of range was a major bit of fuel for this run, and he also deserves equal blame for driving this category to this low of a time. Thanks to Glasnock, Woolworth, and Sheet Metal for getting me into this speed game in the first place. Also, thank you to the following other community members for their contributions and just being awesome. You too can interact with all of these great people and more on the KOTOR speedrunning Discord, an invite link to, for which is in the description. We are a welcoming community of friends who are all very passionate about this game and Star Wars in general. Whether you want to run, glitch hunt, or just watch, or even chat about KOTOR, you're welcome to come along. You can watch Range Speedrun Live at twitch.tv slash range underscore underscore. That's r4ng3 underscore underscore. Link will be in the description. 
You can also occasionally catch me live at twitch.tv slash lane underscore m. That link will also be in the description. You can find out more about KOTOR speedruns at speedrun.com slash KOTOR1. This site features all of our leaderboards, as well as a vast collection of guides and resources to help you with your KOTOR journey. Well, that's about it for me. Thanks so much for watching. Let me know in the comments down below if I did a really crap job with this video. Take care, and may the force be with you.